praise the Lord. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 14, 1 to 6. And the topic here is preaching to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And it says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty, a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand. And forty and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb, and in their mouth was found no guile. For they are without fault before the throne of God, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Again, reading verse number 1, it says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. One must see where the lamb is, and one notices that the lamb is on Mount Zion. The Lamb as we, the church, understand him is Jesus Christ, because he was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He is the one who took our sins for us and saved us. The Apostle John sees the Lamb, and of course that Lamb was on Mount Zion. There has to be a significance to being on Mount Zion. There's also the fact that Jesus Christ is not alone there. But it states there are 144,000 with him. There's something else that is stated about these 144,000 people. They have their father's name written in their foreheads. Thus, when one looks at Jesus Christ, he's the lamb, but he's also the father, for he created us. The 144,000 then are the ones who follow Jesus and have their his name as the Father written in their foreheads, for they know the name of their Father. The question is, is Mount Zion referring to a place on earth, or does it refer to the heavenly place, the New Jerusalem? Here, it seems like it would be in heaven. And so, it's referring to the New Jerusalem, that is the true Mount Zion. For there is where the Lord of the word of the Lord comes forth, and those who are with him have listened to his voice. The question also is, what is the meaning behind the number of 144,000? Surely it would not be just that number that would be saved coming out of the Great Tribulation period. Seems like it would be a perfect number. In any case, these are the ones who truly know their father, for that is why his name is written in their foreheads, for they understood he who is their father. It sounds like the reason why the name of the father is written in their foreheads is because they knew him, came to know him, believed him as their true father. It's not something supposedly written on their foreheads, but rather something that has been written in their foreheads, possibly due to their understanding of the revelation received, which the 144,000 have gotten. Therefore, it may just be that anyone who receives a revelation of who the Father is, that is when his name is written within or in their foreheads. Thus, they know who he is, and they do not forget who their real Father is is the creator thus they know the truth and that truth is who their father is that would bring them with that knowledge of who the father is to the gospel message as well or it was preached to them before 
I say this with assurance that, in reality, how can anyone have their father's name written in their forehead? To me, it would sound like having something transpire on earth. And that, to me, would have been the time that we received a revelation of who the Father is. Others may contest that it may have been when we have been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Granted, it could be both or one or the other. Uh, those who have had the revelation of the name of the Father, it seems like they have that tenacity to endure with that concept and that nothing can move them away from it except by their own choice. However, when they have received a revelation of who the Father is, rather than just the Son, the name of the Father is written in their forehead. That is a blessed assurance that one knows who the Father is. It seems like it says the name of their Father was written in their foreheads, not the name of the Son, per se. But we know that the name of Jesus is the name of our Father, and which is also the name of the Son. In John chapter 16, 25, it says, These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, for the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. That speaks right there the fact that people in the church need to know the name of their Father because it will be written in their forehead. And Jesus said that he would show us plainly of the Father, meaning that the people in the church age would get a revelation of who the Father is so that that name can be written in their forehead. Thus, it can be stated with assurance that the disciples up to that point, up to that point where Jesus said this, had not yet that revelation had not yet received that revelation of who the Father is. But Jesus was going to show them plainly, so it would be, in my opinion, that when they had received the revelation of who Jesus is, that is when the Father's name was written in their foreheads. For Jesus had showed them who the Father is, and since they had known it, and the others in the world had not known it, it must have been written in their foreheads. Verse number two, it says, And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Here are the voices that the apostle John had heard. One sounded like the voice of many waters, the other voice of a great thunder, or the same voice, and another voice, or the same voice, of harpers harping with their harps. Alleluia. The voice of harpers were harping with their harps, meaning that that musical instrument that was played in John's day and played in the day of King David, the Apostle John was hearing a sound, no doubt, of the really wonderful sound from heaven above. Though today, few people may be playing harps within the church, there are many other musical instruments that are played, such as guitars, the keyboard, and the like. The only instrument I suppose that the Apostle John could identify the sounds with was the harp. And he used the word harping to, in essence, speak of those things that they were playing. And he mentioned the harps. If indeed those were instruments being played, no doubt, while in the church age, the saints have come to play many other musical instruments and basically put down the harp, <laughs> per se. But the sounds that were coming from those musical instruments would have, been, would have made anyone to stop and listen, for they sounded, no doubt, very beautiful indeed, actually coming from heaven. If one focuses on the one voice that he had heard, the question arises, Whose voice might that have been? Since they were on the Mount Zion, it could have been the voice of those 144,000, and if that happened to be the voice of those who proclaimed the gospel message, like the message of many waters, 
Jesus had said, John seven thirty seven to 39 In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Thus, when the church with the Holy Spirit speaks, it sounds like a river flowing like water, that is, living water. Therefore, the voice from heaven was the voice of God himself that had spoken it, it appears, but he had spoken through those who had received the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it is the voice of many waters that go throughout the earth, preaching the gospel and the kingdom of God. It's no doubt that when the 144,000 had had that revelation of who the Father is, and following him, him, it would lead to the true gospel message, or it would be because of the true gospel message, that brings others to have the Father's name written in their foreheads. And so, if you answer the question, who is your Father, or who is your spiritual Father, or who is the Father, and if you say specifically a name, that means that you know <laughs> it must be there. Hallelujah. For me, I know what the Father's name is. I call him Jesus. So it's there. I know. It's no doubt. Then the 144,000 had that revelation of who the Father is and followed him. It would lead to the true gospel or because of the gospel message that had been preached to them. That And they help others have the same effect come upon them. That the Father's name is written in their foreheads. And that would be something permanent, unless, of course, the one decides to turn away from God. Yet it is at that moment that the name of the Father is written in their forehead, that they are known uh, by God because they have come to the knowledge of who the Father really is. He had heard the voice of a great thunder, that is John. That is, when one looks at the sentence grammatically, it looks as though one, the one voice that he had heard was the voice of many waters. But also that same voice was the, as the voice of a great thunder. When the Apostle John, though, says he had heard a voice, that is, he had heard a sound, it was as though he had heard a sound of many, that is, waters. And from that same voice came a thunder. The thunder is that which is loud, and that which many can hear it similarly. Again, or similar again to someone that may be preaching, a sound that speaks forth the word, the will of God, the true sound of the voice of God, was speaks for him on the earth. And in all reality, those that have their father's name written in their foreheads are the ones who are testifying who Jesus is. And they speak of him, ministering to others who accept him, get his name also placed in their foreheads. It's because from them comes that same revelation when they're willing to receive and believe the truth. Then the sound of many harpers are harping with their harps. Verse number three says, And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the forty, but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. Thus, here it indicates where they were. They were in heaven, for they were singing before the throne of God. Then, the next question might be, then, did they get the name of the Father written upon them in heaven or on earth? I believe it would be on earth. And I do believe it was when they received a revelation of the Father. Since they are on Mount Zion, um, it follows that Mount Zion is in heaven rather than on earth. One can say that during the time of the law of Moses, the law was brought forth from God on Mount Sinai, but then later the temple was built. 
God dwelt there. However, today he is in his body, the church of the living God. In Isaiah 8:18 8, it says, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. So <laughs> we know that God dwells in us, and he also is in heaven. God is also in heaven, and that is where his word comes forth, speaking to his body. He is also in us, and we speak to others. And those, uh, and there are those who are preaching the word of God. The song that they sang, it states, was as it were a new song. How could it be a new song? It could have been new for the Apostle John to hear, obviously. It could have been new to those who sang it. However, had they sung an, such a song on earth while they were in the body of Christ on earth, maybe it was not new to them. However, what seems quite interesting is knowing that these 144,000 144, have the same language or can sing in the same language. And are these people that represent all different countries and tongues, or is it just one tongue? Then, and it would have to appear to be a new song, for they're singing it together from all, but maybe they're singing from all different countries. Or is it just one country? That's a question. Alleluia. He stated that no one could learn that song but the 144,000. Was it because they had received the gift of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is the one that guiding them to sing it and the others without the Holy Spirit are not able to, to learn it? These uh, are questions. They were redeemed from the earth because, no doubt, of what Jesus Christ had done for them. And, of course, for us, the body of Christ. Verse 4 says, These are they which are, were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. As in Matthew, where it speaks of virgins, the, these were referring to the body of Christ, or those who were in the church. It's not referring to just women, per se, but men, too, that are in the body of Christ. Christ. It could be represented as a particular church body, or individuals therein, for there were five ready, five that were not ready, the wise and the foolish versions. Being defiled with women seems to lead to one to believe that may be referring to false doctrine. Hence, they were not defiled with that false doctrine, but they were virgins, that is, they were preaching the truth of the gospel, not allowing themselves to become tainted with a false doctrine. And it says, These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. Because also the Father's name is written in their forehead, so they know the, 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 who Jesus is, who God is. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. Because they follow the Lamb, they knew his voice. In fact, one could say that is how they were brought to heaven by the voice of the Lamb calling for them to come up first into the clouds, then to be with him forever. Um, if that happened at the rapture, that's of course. Yet the question may be asked, how is it that they follow the Lamb since he is not visible, per se, with their, with their own eyes or our own eyes, unless we see him in a vision? And how is it that all of those who are in the church can follow him since he is the only one? Amen. No doubt this must refer to the Spirit of God. Following or being led by the Spirit of God is the way to follow the Lamb. Because one has followed the Spirit of God's lead, that same person or group of people have listened to the preaching of the Word of God and have come to that knowledge of who Jesus Christ really is. Because they've had a revelation of who he is, and they continue in their quest to follow the Spirit's leading to do what he wants. This part is where it refers being redeemed from among men, 
because was because they were following the Spirit's call and lead. Of course, the Spirit would lead people to come to Him, and in so doing, it would lead people to be redeemed by repenting, being baptized in the name of Jesus, and receiving the Holy Spirit. That's being led. The fierce fruits unto God and to the Lamb sounds like the first ones who came into the faith of Jesus Christ. Though it would seem that since this is revelation, it refers to the time which is to come. But the first fruit sounds like it were those who came into the faith first by following Jesus Christ. And those first fruits would seemingly be those of the nation of Israel. Because it was first preached unto them in Jerusalem, then expanding throughout Israel and on to other nations. Thus, the first part may refer to those that were converted in Israel till the time that Israel was no longer a nation, per se, or those who came into the faith before other nations did, or at least one particular nation, the nation of Israel, and then later on other nations came in. So they were counted as the first fruits unto God, that is the nation of Israel, Jews. Verse 5 says, And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. This had to come about, no doubt, because the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse them from all iniquity and sins, as he has done for us. Therefore, it was not just their mouth that was cleansed, but it was their entire souls, since it states that, for they are without fault before the throne of God. The only way for them to be without fault is for them to have repented, baptized in Jesus' name, and filled with the Holy Spirit. However, why then must it make mention of their mouths? Truly, the Holy Spirit, upon entering a human life, becomes Lord even of that person's mouth. For the person is uttering other tongues led by the Spirit of God. Thus, this is also part of that which one can say the person is being led by the Spirit. For when one speaks in tongues, one is being led by the Spirit in what a person utters. That's also said in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 4. In fact, I'll just go there. It says in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 4, it says... And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. In other words, that is the leading of the Spirit of God. Amen. So when one speaks in tongues, one is being led by the Spirit in what a person utters, and that would be God leading a person to speak in tongues. Also in prayer or praise, to God. No doubt, while they are uttering their prayers or worship or praise to God, it states without fault. <laughs> For it's the Spirit that leads the prayer, the praise, and the worship to God. One might say that this corresponds to Revelation 6 2, which states the following And I saw, behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Why it might refer to this portion of scripture is because the one on the horse was given a crown, and this might have been the first fruits unto God, that which was the nation of Israel, redeemed before the throne, going for further to conquer, meaning that he was going around to other nations to get more people and more crowns from other countries across the globe. Thus, it could have started there, and we did it uh, literally, and here maybe figuratively, that the one on the white horse riding about goes to conquer nation after nation, getting crown after crown. Thus, this part might refer to this beginning, for it represents the first fruits unto God. It's a thought. Verse number 6 says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell in the earth, and to every nation, and to kindred, and tongue, and people. So then it goes from the first fruits, and then goes, verse number 6, 
to the other nations. And so uh, it also may refer to a different realm and different tongue. Another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach. So the question is, with this angel that has the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people, is it referring to that gospel in their language, or just the gospel in uh, the first language that was written, which was mm, Greek at the time, or in every language that the angel had that gospel in, uh, ready to be delivered to other every nation. But yet, if we look at the number of tongues or languages that still do not have the written word of God in their language, there are many. So, anyway, here it may be going to a different time period in part, for it begins with, and I saw another angel fly, meaning that it refers to some other difference, a different maybe time frame, um, different in line with the former, but in line with the former, for the former was the first fruits, but this part goes to every other nation, kindred, and tongue, and people. And in views of those tongues, or in other words, languages, that yet need, for example, the Bible, um, those that have translated the Bible, Wycliffe, they said 10%, according to their um, website, wycliffe.net, resources, statistics, they say that about 80% of the people have a Bible in their language, but only 10% of languages have a complete Bible. That is complete Bible. So 80% of the people, but 10% of the languages have a complete Bible. Thus it appears that there is still a lot of work to be done. It's getting closer and closer to the time that we will have, that all will have a Bible, a, a complete Bible, true church, a people who will give to Jesus their, the crown of their nation and tongue. That angel was in the midst of heaven and had the gospel to preach to those that were on the earth. What is intriguing in this part is that the angel had it give, had it to give to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. If one thinks about this, yes, the gospel started in one tongue or one language into one people, which included the first fruits under God in the beginning of the chapter. However, this portion refers to the rest of the nations and, and so on. Thus, the angel had the gospel, but one thinks, did he, did he really have it in the languages of all the people at that time? And it's still... <laughs> being presented to people in the world today. Of course, the original was in one language. And was it just that one language that that the angel had it, or did he have it in every language ready to distribute to every nation, tongue, and people? Thus, if he did have it in every tongue, it is still being distributed today. That which the angel had when the apostle John had seen him. Something to think about. May God bless you today, in Jesus' name. Amen.